It is indeed. Hello, everybody. Um, just give a sec while everyone gets into the room. Um, welcome to our tech talk for um, today, um, where we're going to dive deep into another reality. Um, the 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 um, the impetus for for the the focus of today's discussion was quite a bizarre interview with Mark Zuckerberg over the last week, where he said Facebook was going to um, pivot into being the company that would bring us the metaverse, and it's got me um, going down all sorts of wormholes over the last couple of weeks. So we're looking forward to discussing that and also the latest news in tech. Um, hi to everybody that's joining us. If you're joining us for the first time, this is an initiative of the Centre for Responsible Technology where we get together with some of our favourite people every fortnight to talk through some of the thorny issues around the politics of technology with my regular partners in crime, Lizzie O'Shea, who's the um, founder and chair of Digital Rights Watch, and Dan Stinton, who's the managing director of Guardian Australia. We'll pay um, respects to elders, past, present, emerging before we get cracking. I'm up here in Sydney on Gadigal land in my roof, where I will be for a number of weeks to come, I'm sure. Um, so before we go deep into the metaverse, it'd be good to just sort of just sort of take stock of all the wild stories that have been riding around the world of tech. And I thought it'd be fun just to start with something that each of our key panellists have been looking at in the news. So why don't we start with you, Lizzie? How are you going? Melbourne is in and out of lockdown and you've been you've been looking at data breaches on dating apps, as is your want. That's right. Um, not for me, uh, but for other people. Um, yeah, he, this was an article that was brought to my attention by Sam, who's he's here today, who's one of our great campaigners at Digital Rights Watch. Uh, but it talks about how uh, essentially a priest was exposed, uh, a Catholic priest, for using Grindr, the gay dating app. Dating app? I'm not sure if that's the correct terminology or, in fact, gives you a good description of what it is. But um, obviously it's for people looking to hook up um, and mostly gay people. And uh, the way that this transpired is just a bit horrifying because essentially a bunch of people exposed uh, this priest by uh, getting access to advertising data that Grinder may not have intentionally uh, passed on. It, it certainly wasn't a, a breach technically in Grinder's protocols, but they shared data with advertisers to permit uh, you know, targeted advertising, and then that can then be used to be to re-identify people who might use the app. It's not unlike what happened with Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, where Cambridge Analytica scraped a huge amount of data off uh, Facebook. Uh, in breach of the requirements that Facebook imposes on advertisers or app developers for its platform, uh, and that was then repurposed to build a facial recognition database. In, the, in this example, there's not actually a breach of the terms of use, I suppose, on one level uh, in terms of grinders policing of how this data is used. It, that's technically legal. But the reality is that anonymised de-identified data can be repurposed for other um, uses. And this is an example where that was used to expose the identity of a priest. I mean, I'm kind of troubled by the celibacy requirement to become a Catholic priest. And But even if you put that to one side, you can see how data of this nature could be used to target uh, and, you know, harass, victimise certain sections of the population, most obviously people who might not be out of the closet, who are using these kinds of apps, who want to stay in the closet for whatever reason, who then don't manage to, uh, who may be at risk of not being able to do that. And Really what it highlights for me is the political economy of data. Um, Data-driven advertising can have really negative consequences for users when their expectation is that they're using this app in a private way. But the reality of the data economy is that that may not be a promise that can be kept by apps, um, which seems like a terrible shame mm. and potentially enabling some really bad behaviour. So how did the, how was the data acquired for the, outing if you want to call it that well so de-identified data sets are shared by grinder as far as i can understand for the purposes of creating targeted advertisements so you may wish to target someone by their location for example and advertise to them and you know that they're you're doing that on grinder so you're able to filter who's who sees ads uh, that requires sharing of data with advertisers for that purpose you can purchase that data 
that then you can use for another purpose entirely. And in this instance, it was to identify somebody, I presume that they suspected he was using this app to verify that. Um, so these data sets exist for advertisers to use, but the reality is it takes very little to re-identify people, um, but also, you know, the apps are interested in collecting that information so they can sell this space to advertisers because that's how they monetize their platform. Um, so it's a, an inevitable consequence of monetizing mm -hmm. data. You're a purveyor of the dark arts, Dan. Is this a, is this a feature or a bug? You always introduce me this way, Peter. I um, know, I know. Like, you, you know so many other things, I know. Do you believe in adding gay priests in this way, Dan? Uh, yeah, clearly not. So uh, look, I think there's two <laughs> issues here. I think, um, well, there's a number of issues, but I'll, I'll leave the issues of the Catholic Church to one side for a second. But I think that the two issues with regards to data are um, re-identification, as you've uh, outlined, Lizzie, and I think it's it's this is just another example of that proves it's relatively easy to re-identify people um, if you have enough text mark uh, to do it. Um, the other thing I'm probably more concerned about, though, is actually just the harm of, of discrimination that can exist because of uh, the data that can be extracted from all these different advertising uh, platforms. I mean, if you think about it, there, there are standard um, IAB endorsed advertising platforms, uh, sorry, categories where you can target people that are both very high net worth individuals or very low net worth individuals or people that have an interest in quitting smoking, for example. Even there's a category for people who are interested in um, bail bonds. So it's not hard to see how sort of harmful discrimination can exist or can take place. So if you take the, the quitting smoking one, now the plus side for that is that would be something which someone who's selling nicotine patches, it would be worthwhile to advertise to that cohort of users. If you're a health insurer, for it, though, you could discriminate and exclude those people from your products. So this is where I think the, there's a whole bunch of harm that's taking place, which we don't even know about, I think, at the moment. And that's, um, again, it comes back to uh, strengthening privacy regulations is just one thing to try and try and fight against this. Do you yeah. think, Dan, that we should be able to sell um, de-identified data in this way for advertisers to make use of or to insurance companies? I mean, there's an argument that the whole, that economy just, doesn't serve any useful purpose for everyday people and in fact should be prohibited? Um, the short answer is no, I don't. But, but, I, but I think it's the problem we've got at the moment, particularly in Australia, is that there are virtually no restrictions on what data can be traded. Um, and uh, the Privacy Act from 1988 is just obviously substantially out of date. It's, it predates the internet or at least the widespread use of it. So um, I think without question that the, the, the smaller the cohort, the smaller the targeting capabilities, the smaller the number of people that you can target, the greater the for potential that, that there is for potential harm. And so I think there needs to be some kind of regulation around um, just how, how much targeting is actually possible. Because at the moment, you know, as I said, targeting people with an interest in bail bonds uh, is, a, is an IAB endorsed category. And I think there is no justification for that in any in any case. Hmm. Um, I'll move along because I don't want to totally go down this particular wormhole today. The, 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 the other issue that had a lot of um, coverage over the last week was a investigation that The Guardian was part of, Dan, around the, um, the Pegasus um, project. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how that's unfolded and also what's been the reaction since the story broke? Yeah, so look, this, was, this is a massive project for us, huge project. Um, uh, it's effectively a, a data leak of, of more than 50,000 phone numbers um, dating back to 2016. Um, uh, and it was enabled by software sold by Israelis NSO group. They, they sell surveillance software effectively. Um, so this story was uncovered by Forbidden Stories. Uh, they're a, a Paris-based um, not-for-profit journalism organisation, but they worked in partnership with Amnesty International on this and they shared access to this list of names with, with 16 media organisations around the world, including The Guardian, who, who took a pretty active lead on this. Um, where do I start? Look, more than 80 journalists have worked on this over several months. It was a, it was a pretty substantial project and, and working on it was pretty difficult because all of the journalists had to assume that they were also being, they were under surveillance as they pulled it together. But I'll, I'll park that for a second, just in case people haven't read about it and don't know what exactly it, it, this software does. And effectively, what, what we have uncovered is that this NSO software has the ability to infect 
any Android or iPhone device simply by sending either an SMS or a WhatsApp message or an iMessage. Um, the end user doesn't even have to click on that message or interact with it in order for this software to be put onto the phone. And then what you can do, what this software is able to do is just downright scary. I mean, you can basically, you have full control over the phone. You can access all historical messages, including encrypted messages, uh, if they're still stored on the phone. Um, you can turn on the microphone and camera without the uh, user knowing it. Uh, you can listen in on phone calls. I mean, it is kind of Orwellian how, um, how capable this software is. Um, and the, the scary thing is, if you've been if your device has been compromised, it's very difficult for you to even know that. Not impossible, but very difficult. Um, and it's almost impossible for you to stop it happening again in the future. So, um, and the NSO group, um, they, they claim that they've only sold this to um, governments which have you know, strong human rights records, but that list includes, I'm gonna read a couple, Rwanda, Saudi Arabia, Arabia Bahrain, UAE, um, and India. And the India in particular, there's evidence that the government used this software um, to spy on opposition party politicians, dissident journalists, uh, lawyers, intellectuals, um, a, a whole range of people, uh, even um, Imran Khan in, in, from Pakistan. So, uh, and then separate to India, there's, there's evidence that Emmanuel Macron's phone was also compromised uh, with his software. So look, the key takeaway from this is, I think, I don't know if we can stop it. I mean, it just, how do you, how do you exist in today's world without your mobile phone and short of putting it um, underneath your pillow and uh, walk, going to another room, how do you? How can you possibly be sure that you're not being spied on? I, I just, um, it's quite concerning. And last point on this, and I'll finish my monologue. What's been also a little bit disappointing about this is this is such a massive story for us. As I mentioned, it was a huge project. It involved our, our journalists having to um, do exactly what I've just said, actually, and meet up in secret, in person to discuss these things while leaving their mobile phones locked in other rooms so that they couldn't be used to spy on them. Um, there has been a, a, a strong reaction to this, but nowhere near what I think we were expecting. Um, and it just kind of demonstrates that most people shrug their shoulders at this stuff. And uh, considering the, the potential for harm, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised, to be honest, a little bit disappointed. Yeah, it, it did seem to have a hit and then sort of back into that whole privacy discourse that, you know, well, I've got, I'm, not, I'm not in that world, so I've got nothing to worry about. Lizzie, what was your reaction when you um, saw these reports? Yeah, I, I, um, I was sort of surprised that it wouldn't have attracted more attention in the sense that um, journalists tend to be good about talking about things that affect journalists. And this is a clear uh, example of that. Uh, it makes it very difficult for people to do their job. I mean, there, there's an example of a, a Mexican freelance reporter who um, died in a car bombing who's it seems like it was it can be inferred that this was used uh, and has the capability of tracking location so presumably there's a real life and death consequence to the use of this kind of um, spyware uh, I think it is interesting to think about how you could frame demands around this. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about this because uh, I was asked to talk about it on ABCRN and we were discussing it and I was thinking, you know, the, our government should say that then they would never use this. You know, that's one thing I would expect our government to say. Um, it's not, I don't think it's clear that the Australian government did do this, but, um, and then I think to myself, they, they're, they're so much on the front foot, the surveillance state, that I don't think they would feel that they owed anyone um, the the right to be to hear that or to make that undertaking. But it is a form of warfare, um, and I think we should think about it in that way. Uh, that it can lead to people losing their lives. This is not just an in an. In, it doesn't just impact the fourth estate. It impacts lots of uh, ways in which states interact with each other and it can have real world consequences for everyday people. So I don't know. One of the questions that did rise, arise for me, Dan, though, was I was interested to know what you end up doing with all these numbers because surely there's an obligation um, morally to talk to people who might be on that list. But I don't really know how you go about doing that. And I wondered if there was any plan to kind of notify people that they may have been affected by this. Oh, look, I don't know is the short answer. Um, and I have to stress, right, I'm, I'm not a journalist or at least haven't been one for a very long time. And I was a pretty mediocre one when I was one uh, 20 years ago. So I, 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 um, I haven't been involved uh, on the front line of this. Um, I know that um, there... 
our, our journalism team though was we did, a, we did a podcast series on this and they were particularly sensitive to the fact that um, there, there's 50,000 people that are on this list. We don't actually know whether all 50,000 of them have been compromised. Um, and in fact, all we're really certain of is that less than 100 have definitely been compromised. So um, I guess it's a question of, do you notify all 50,000 people that they're on this list or not? I, I mean, I just, look, I don't know whether that's happened or not. I guess thinking about it, not from the Guardian's perspective, but just uh, as a citizen, if you like, um, I mean, I think there is an obligation to tell these people, right? I mean, if, if, you, if, if you've uncovered that 50,000 people, um, you know, the majority of them, good people as well that aren't up to nefarious activity are on this list, why wouldn't you inform them so? Um, you know, I think, uh, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, but answer, uh, sorry, there's a long, long an answer. I don't know whether that's taking place or not. I, I, um, I might try and find out. My, my thought on this is though also around, and I note that it was described as um, weapons grade software. It, it, it strikes me that this is privately built technology being sold to governments a bit like armaments would be sold to governments. Um, it seems that if you go to, to the earlier question, can you do anything about it? There, there needs to be frameworks around the way that governments access technology to um, spy on their own citizens and spy on other citizens, I would have thought. And if you use by way of analysis or analogy, there are certain arms treaties that are put in place between countries and multilateral and unilateral treaties as well. Is that one way of thinking about it, do you reckon, Lizzie? Because I, otherwise it is just sort of giving up and saying it is an, a massive wild west and, you know, governments can purchase material that will break us all apart. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, and there are precedents for this, of course, chemical weapons, torture, these things are prohibited internationally. I, I'm not uh, so naive to think that they still aren't used or practised, but uh, that kind of consensus does serve a purpose. And I think it would be also naive to pretend that's not true. So I think it's an interesting way to talk about it, to treat it as a form of um, warfare that we should stop and undertake not to commit ourselves. Um, I mean, I also think it, it creates a market, I suppose, for products that are less susceptible to this kind of, um, you know, use of spyware or yes, less susceptible to the spyware. And I think it it is really, this reporting is really important. Um, and I'm very grateful for The Guardian for doing it for that purpose alone, so that makers of hardware can be alive to this potential problem and attempt to fix it much in the same way that in the wake of the Snowden revelations, many platform service providers and the like introduced encryption and end to end in an end-to-end -end manner to try and, you know, do something about users' valid concerns that they were potentially subject to mass bulk surveillance. So it is really important work from that perspective, even if um, it, it's very difficult to think of a policy response or demand upon government that is going to be acceptable or, or taken up. Uh, there's real techni technology is the other way in which we fight this. And I think there is scope to, to keep working on trying to protect devices, trying to inform users about how this works so that they can figure out ways to work around it um, so that it's not just a political battle, it's also a technological one. Mm -hmm. Lucy, who I've just texted everyone rather than just her directly saying, do you want to jump on and explain your comment, has just said the Wassenaar <laughs> arrangement routinely falls apart when they try to include spyware. Hey, are you there, Lucy? Do you want to explain that? Or have I just made you mute? You're unmute. <laughs> Maybe she's not there. For there she is. Hi. There you go. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm routinely yeah. eating during these things. So, um... I always have the camera off, but I just, um, I've been working on this for a few years. And in the EU, we tried to um, influence the way the export control structure happens because governments have um, historically certain checks and balances on weapons and weapons grade technology um, moving around the world. And funny when Peter mentioned that there should be an international agreement, there is the Vassadar arrangement, which the Obama administration tried to amend to include some of these tools. At the time, I think they called it intrusion technology. So the idea that there's a spyware software that intrudes into the software that you're running on your phone and takes certain data out. 
and it completely fell apart internationally uh, because the tech community um, was confused about what constitutes where intrusion software ends and where things like um, firewalls and, and antivirus software um, begin in terms of functionality. So it's really tricky um, to define it on a technological level. Like what defines a good program that a technology company can run in the background without you knowing? And what defines something that's malicious that a government is installing? It's very complicated. That said, um, governments have a vested interest in not, um, in not regulating it because a lot of governments use it. And, um, you know, this is, I appreciate the effort that um, Dan described. I went through something similar in 2018 when we uh, published a report that I co-authored on the use of a similar piece of technology used in Turkey against peaceful activists. It was called Finn Fisher. Um, and, um, you know, the, the sort of amount of work that needed to go into the research um, and actually putting that together was insane. Um, and the reception by the public, I mean, was good, but uh, we couldn't, you know, it's, I think it's such a meta thing um, that people have a really hard time conceptualizing what it means for their everyday lives. And the other thing that I struggle with, and I don't know how Lizzie um, or Dan think about that, but people almost accept that that's the way the world works now. So we would always come out with these like revelations that this technology is being used by government. This technology is being, and sometimes the companies disintegrate because investment companies um, remove themselves if you're tied to human rights violations. So the financial angle is one we've been able to exploit very successfully in the past. And actually, sorry, two years ago, we even blocked um, an SO group who creates Pegasus. We blocked them from being acquired by Blackstone, which is a huge investment company. So the financial angle works a bit, but the rest of the world kind of shrugs. And I think in terms of communicating that to the population, um, I think people just really have accepted that the, that's the way the world works. And to me, that's kind of terrifying that people no longer find that um, appalling in any way. This is what's so disappointing about it, Lucy. It's just that there's just this kind of acceptance that this is the world we live in now. It's just, I mean, if you, if, if you had have said 40 years ago, the government or any government, well, in fact, anyone that's got a lot of money, let alone government, has the potential to follow you around wherever you go and listen to everything you say and all of your conversations and everywhere you go online, not that that existed 50 years ago, but anyway, take my point. Um, I mean, it would have been horrifying. And this is actually the world that, we've, that we live in now. And people are just accepting that this is, this is just what the price of, of the efficiencies and, and, and beautiful things that come with technology. But, but it's also the end point of all the things we've shrugged our shoulders at. Like I still blow my head every time I think about cookies and the fact that you go to a site and they attach a bit of spyware on you and follow you around the internet. Like, and at yeah. some point, there, there must have been an acceptance that that was okay. Um, and people, yeah. you know, don't refuse to go to sites and constantly you click, oh yeah, I'll take them because I want to go into the site. Mm. Anywho. Sorry, one more point on this. This is, this is why, as much as I think it's self-serving and as much as I think they're not quite as squeaky clean as I can they are, I'm actually really encouraged by what Apple is doing. Not, not so much because I think they're perfect in any way. This example proves that they're not. Um, but at least they're starting to bring a conversation, uh, a mainstream conversation back towards privacy. So it's not just people like us talking about this, you know. At least they're starting to make this something which is more mainstream. Sorry, Lizzie, I cut you off. <laughs> Not at all. I, I agree with you. I think that what it symbolises is that this, dis, this discussion's moved on from being perhaps a minority, happening in minority spaces to being a much more mainstream discussion about privacy. It's not just for people who want to wear tinfoil hats. It's actually something that we all have a right to be concerned about. And I suppose what I'd say is I kind of draw often in my mind the comparison with climate change because we talk about, you know, what have we accepted? Um, in part, I feel like there's a whole generation of people who've come of age who I suppose they could be um, characterised as having accepted climate change as part and parcel of their lives, but they've not really had the control, the knowledge, the capacity to do something about it until relatively recently. And now these discussions are quite mainstream about how we're going to address it. And I think it's similar with these kinds of issues. The technology is always deliberately moved faster than people's understanding of how it operated. And that kind of... Um, 
opacity, um, deliberately obscuring how things work um, has been imposed both upon users, but also policymakers by tech companies, um, by agencies within government who've got an interest in this. So I, I agree we're at a point where there's some resignation when it comes to the general public, but um, that is a deliberate product of uh, a conscientious effort on the part of industry and also surveillance agencies to create that dynamic. And it is telling, I think, that we're now starting to have a different conversation about privacy because of the last sort of few years in which this discussion has come to the fore. Uh, and even though these, these moments don't maybe seem as impactful as we might presume they ought to be, uh, I think they do gradually build up towards shifting that larger Overton window about what our expectations are when it comes to privacy and, and the growing awareness. So I think we have to resist that kind of um, fatalism uh, while also understanding that it's, a, it's an outcome that was deliberately created rather than something that is a function of, of um, laziness or acceptance on the part of the population. Mm. So talking about looking at where tech goes next, um, the Zook gave a series of interviews over the last fortnight after addressing his own staff, basically saying that Facebook was no longer going to be this one-dimensional social network. It was going to move into the internet and into what he called the metaverse. Um, and I just want to say up front that a lot of what he was talking about actually resonated with me. Um, I've One of the things I've loved about running these sorts of events is you feel like you're in the internet rather than um, on the internet. Um, he also talks in the piece about that it wouldn't be owned, like what his vision isn't a ubiquitous corporate environment. It's companies sitting with public spaces, sort of, sort of the Eli Parisa stuff. So I don't, my tendency just to say Zuckerberg's putting it out so it's necessarily a terrible idea. I don't want to start there. I want to actually dig in and imagine, is he onto something? Because he's picked a few horses that have been right in the past. And then to sort of get our head around, well, what, what is real? What is bullshit? And then if there is a world in which we are moving deeper into the internet, what could that look like? So um, I'm interested in Lizzie and Dan's initial um, reactions to the piece. And anyone else in the chat that wants to share their views, you can just say, BS, 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 that's fine. But then we've also got um, Michaela, who's an expert in virtual reality. So I thought it'd be great to, to bring her in after we've heard top line thoughts from Dan and Lizzie and just sort of get a sense of what the hell he's talking about and what is, I guess, real and what is BS around this sort of discussion. So why don't you bowl out Lizzie first? Yeah, well, the... Um... It's an interesting interview because I do think that it's hard to separate out what might be genuinely interesting ideas about what the technological future could look like for um, having a greater sense of community, of personality in uh, a fully integrated internet uh, without thinking about how that's going to be monetized or the political economy that sits below it. I think it's very difficult to separate them out. So I'm not, I don't think Mark Zuckerberg is stupid or easily or should be quickly dismissed. But uh, I also think there's um, some utility in him framing this as a bold thinking in circumstances where it, it does suit his, his business model. Um, it, and so to that degree, I think it would be a mistake to try and separate them but I, I do think it is worth also imagining what an internet could look like that was built by and for people rather than just um, for making money so you know I can absolutely see why um, you know our current engagement with online could could become quite a different world in which uh, all sorts of other forms of technology most obviously virtual reality uh, but you know other other kinds as well could be better integrated so that we have a um, a sense of uh, community that is more real than what it currently is. The pandemic's shown perhaps more than anything, just how critically important uh, the web and the internet is to us being able to sh have a community uh, when we can't necessarily um, interact in person. 
So this will be an increasing part of our future. I do sort of wonder what the particular impacts might be for things like work, which is less fun, less enjoyable, um, perhaps uh, more onerous and has the potential to be a much nastier experience of an integrated web that is quite invasive. Um, and whether we start to draw boundaries around some of these things preemptively so that um, we can see them as different ways in which we might engage online. Because the other thing I think that the that the pandemic showed us is that, um, you know, living and working in your home, um, hugely dependent on the internet, can be very bad for your mental health and sense of community as well. So I think it's important to perhaps think about how we might be able to engage in online spaces in more meaningful ways, uh, be in the internet rather than on it, but also that that might be uh, something that we treat differently depending on what we're using it for, whether we're using it for, for work or play, for example. Dan, you did a bit of deep diving once you'd um, read this into some of the thinking around the metaverse. What's your top line thinking on this? I mean, how long have we got? I, we, um, I went down a metaverse rabbit hole about uh, a month or two ago and, and was pretty heavily influenced by um, a venture capitalist called Daniel Wall, who, who published a series of essays on this. I'll, I'll put it in the chat in a second for those of you that haven't seen it. Um, Look, I think I, I could probably echo some of the things that Izzy, uh, Lizzie said. I think that um, there's this. There's so much. For, for those of you who don't know, by the way, I mean, the, the, a very shorthand description of what the metaverse could become is, is effectively an, an evolution of the internet. As as Peter said, it's it's kind of a a combination of both uh, the physical real world as well as virtual reality, um, augmented reality, which, which you can sort of be, you're not just consuming content, but you're actually part of the content, I guess is, is a way to, to, is one way to think about it. There's a lot more to it than that. I won't bore everyone with, with my um, explanation. Um, I'm sure Michaela's going to be, have a much better, to be able to do a much better job of that than me. But anyway, the, the couple of points on, on Facebook in particular, um, what I am, particularly, I think what I think we need to remember, as much as I, I take your point, Pete, you don't want to just dismiss everything because Mark Zuckerberg said it. What I think we have to remember is that Facebook is the second largest advertising company in the world. And I think we've shown what can go wrong when uh, a company which is all about maximising advertising is creating what has become an essential part of most people's daily lives and social networks. And so we've got this opportunity here with, um, I guess, the evolution of the mobile internet to this metaverse or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, what I would love to see is I'd love to see that universe not just being created by private companies or startups which are venture capital backed, which are looking for massive returns, but actually started by civic organisations as well um, or governments or uh, with public spaces and um, public functions at the heart of it from the beginning, because that's the mistake we made with the internet, right? It's become dominated by a handful of very large private companies with private motives. Um, and so I don't know how we do that, but perhaps um, some enlightened individuals which uh, have made a huge amount of money off the internet can pour some of that, some of those billions into um, creating um, public and civic spaces in, in the metaverse uh, for, for, when this, for when this comes into being. Yeah, um, right. Anyway, I'm not sure if that's helpful. That's my initial impression. Yeah. yeah. Well, Michaela, put us right on what we're actually talking about here. So I think <laughs> the three of us are talking about it conceptually. You work in this space. So explain to us a little bit about what you do and your thoughts on how this could grow as a, a bigger part of people's lives. Oh, well, thanks for the intro. intro. This is a, a very interesting conversation um, uh, to everyone, uh, even those who've never heard the term metaverse. And to me, particularly, because I, I have spent most of my career working in this space. So I, I run a small studio in Sydney called Mod, and we're kind of like a hybrid between a, a film and a game company. So essentially we use, we design and build stuff using uh, the tools that are going to create this virtual reality of the future. So I just had a couple of points. Uh, first thing is um, when, Lizzie, when Lizzie talks about, um, you know, the dangers of metadata um, um, being, you um, spread without, you know, to, to the detriment of individuals and that this is a kind of a new class of warfare. I think the, burst, the first flag about these kind of articles that um, like the Zuckerberg piece that we're, we're talking about today is um, there's a real question mark over whether you want this guy in the position of power that uh, the metaverse implies. And, and what I mean by that is, um, as Dan alluded to as well, Facebook's almost become 
like this topic of the Pegasus invasion, is, it, there's a lot of topics at the moment that are just considered almost too big. And I would argue that Facebook is being taken for granted by a lot of people as that it's always going to be there. Um, I started using, um, using the web back in 93, and a lot of us old farts <clears throat> thought the metaverse was going to kick off in 95 <laughs> because these ideas are not new ideas. They've been around since the 50s, and you know, sci-fi has had them for ages. And we honestly thought in 95 when specifications for virtual reality modeling language were going to be unleashed on the world, we really thought a lot of the stuff we're seeing today was going to happen in the 90s, and it didn't. Um, so in a way, there's, a, there's we've been a lot of people been waiting for this for a long time, including Zuckerberg. But um, this is a long term play for him. I just did a quick bit of research. So the 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 vanguard of what Facebook's doing is around a brand called Oculus, and they acquired this virtual reality uh, startup for three billion dollars in 2014. So. The, the, the article that's just come out is not describing something that's a new thing. This is a seven years worth of Facebook um, gobbling up an enormous percentage of the world's brains trust in this area. And it puts professionals and artists and creative people and people with their own, like I run a small business in Sydney. It puts us in a very different, difficult position because on one hand, you have devices like, I won't even take it out of its box, but you've got the Oculus Quest, which- um, What is the is, Oculus Quest? The Oculus Quest is a VR headset. I better take it out of people- Yeah, you better uh, show us. So basically Facebook sells a, a headset that's, they sell it for significantly less than what it costs to make. And it costs about $600 Australian. And on one hand, it's a technological marvel. It's, it's a fairly low priced virtual reality headset um, that, that just works pretty well without any obvious wires or cables. On the other side, like all Facebook's products, it's, you may, I, I personally have a boycott against Facebook, even though professionally my studio builds a lot of stuff with Facebook technology, but you could describe it as a perfect fish trap it's very easy to start using it because it costs less than what it actually costs to make to use it. And the trade-off is that your data and you're increasingly at a disadvantage in your personal life when you start using these tools. And what do I mean by that? So um, for example, as a trans woman, um, Facebook right from the very beginning has had this um, real name policy. You're not allowed to have alter egos online, which is quite a, ironic since that so much of Facebook is now, you know, uh, fake personalities, um, you know, uh, fictitious accounts. But right from the start, they had this notion that you needed to be tracked as an individual. And so you had to have a specific identity. And people accepted that to a large, large degree. Now the idea that you've got something strapped to your head and you are increasingly going to be shown advertising and your biometric data. So back to Lizzie's point about metadata, it's one thing to track where your mouse is moving on a page, but when you can track where your eye is looking and you get all this additional metadata from the movement of your head, um, it's, you don't have to be a science fiction aficionado to think about the dystopian opportunities there. So that's on one side of the fence, but I think Facebook ultimately is not too big to fail. They didn't exist at the start of my career. And I, I'm hoping over time that people will understand that when Zuckerberg talks about the need for the metaverse to be this open platform, that Facebook is the exact opposite of an open platform. And so there's, I think we are going to see increasingly uh, a move towards uh, a, an open way of sharing virtual reality and other, and other realities online. But just to give you an idea, this is not hypothetical. This is not, this is not fantasy anymore. So um, in the background of um, my vision here, I'm actually showing you um, a, an environment from a documentary that we're releasing uh, in a couple of weeks time. And this is an indie document, documentary. Uh, it's actually 
uh, a bit like an interactive Four Corners episode where uh, I look at where the money trails are in the religious right in Australia and allow people to, in virtual reality, follow wow. the links between anti-equality uh, lobbying, um, big business and politicians. And this is a, this is a project oh, wow. that's almost impossible <laughs> to fund in Australia. So where's the funding come from? Well, it's come from organisation. It's been largely self-funded via a little studio, but it's also had contributions from companies like Microsoft and Epic Games. And I, I, I put that on the table because we've, as a small studio, we, we, we do get support. So I wanted to acknowledge that. But I think just to wrap up this intro, there isn't one vision of the, of the metaverse. As Dan said, it would be great if there's lots of other players in the space. And the good news is, is that there are, you just don't read about it in the press. So I want to share with you the diametrically opposite view of the metaverse from Facebook, which is what the uh, internet company Mozilla are doing. Now, you may, some, is everyone familiar with Mozilla as the makers of, um, of the Netscape browser, or Firefox? Sorry, I'm showing my age, Firefox. <laughs> so um, Mozilla is this, um, this internet company that has invested not, no, nowhere near what Facebook has, but they've invested a huge amount of time to try and head off what Google and Facebook and Apple are doing which is trying to own the ground underneath us when it comes to the metaverse. And so what Mozilla's done, which is quite interesting, is they've released a platform. They, they release lots of technologies, but one of the things they've released is this platform called Mozilla Hubs. And I'm, I'm mentioning it to you because you may be listening to this conversation and going, what's she talking about? This is all sounds incredibly far-fetched, but I'm here to tell you that not only is um, this stuff old it's not not new but since covid since covid kicked off our little studio has been doing more and more not just business helping people with metaverse tasks but literally every day at 11 a.m we have one of our team members in virtual reality in case people show up in our mozilla hubs room and that that's because We've been helping organizations around the world since the start of COVID move their events into virtual reality. We've helped universities stage graduation ceremonies. We've done events like this where, as well as seeing the people on Zoom, you're, you could also be moving around like in that film Ready Player One um, avatar-wise in virtual reality. But here's the catch. Mozilla's not focusing on how cool it looks they're focusing on the interactive experience. And so what are the, one of the dangers at the moment is that there's a huge gulf between the metaverse type products and properties that look amazing and the ones that give you this open interactive community potential. Mm -hmm. So the, the difference, I would sum it up that um, you, this is a, this screenshot here, I'll just show you those eye, that face in front of you, that's not a, a photograph. That's actually a digital human uh, uh, from a project we worked on a few years with Epic Games. So that's a digital human avatar um, that is, is almost photoreal. And there's a huge move with companies like Epic Games who make Fortnite, who you can't talk about them without mentioning they've got 40% stake from the Chinese telco Tencent. And recently Sony as well has invested in, in Epic. Their metaverse view, look at Fortnite, look at the computer game that is incredible uh, um, successful. Their view is that the metaverse will come out of games. Whereas Facebook's obviously saying the metaverse is gonna come out of surprise, Facebook and Instagram. Um, Mozilla, on the other hand, is saying, we're just going to put as much of this technology into the public domain as open source technology to hopefully allow the ecosystem to develop in a way that it's not just a monoc monoculture. Mm. So we've put a lot of Have energy. Have you had much engagement from civil society in any of this, or is this the start of that conversation? Okay. I think when you, when you say, can you give me some examples what you mean by well, like, civil society? I, well, no, specifics because I know in the broader sense what you mean well you know unions or environment groups or organizations that are trying to sort of build movements and sort of looking at new ways of connecting people now 
Is that even on the radar at the moment or is that going to be the next part of the conversation, do you reckon? I think it's happening overseas, but it's not happening here yet, unfortunately. Wow. And I think Australia's, uh, Australia is, we're very good at being the, 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 uh, the, the adopter once it's proved overseas, but we're not necessarily the, the first culture to dive into things that are new paradigms. So we are, we are definitely seeing um, a grassroots use, um, but it's really, it's still, it's internal. I think that's the key thing here. When you talk about um, actually using this as a tool, like for example, on Monday, I had a two hour um, meeting in VR with my team. We're building a virtual concert system for a, a big US company. And it's all about, you know, trying to recapture that sense of being at a real live event, you know, the big day out or something, but instead you're in virtual reality or you're looking at it through your phone. How on earth is that going to work? Well, Virtual reality is a really good way of just trying out ideas. And so I had a two hour meeting with 10 people. And then afterwards we brought the client in and we showed them stuff. This wasn't something that we're ever going to stick in public. It's not a marketing campaign. It's just an internal productivity tool to help people think, oh, something's over there as opposed to it's above me. Um, so I think there's a lot of quiet use like ours where like if you were planning a mass gathering, for example, you could, within a, an hour, you could take this open Mozilla world and put in a map of the cityscape and say, okay, we're going to we're gonna all join up here or we're going to move to here. Anti-lockdown march, safe anti-lockdown <laughs> march. Well, exactly. I think, I mean, we're, we've actually stopped evangelizing, to be honest, because we've, in my career, I've gone through phases where I've spent way more time talking about this stuff than doing it. Doing it yeah. And the exciting thing right now is that there's tons of work for studios like us, because whether you're a big Hollywood player, you're a tech company, or you're a, a mogul like um, Zuckerberg trying to you know, own everything inside, there's tons of activity going on. And like I said, you don't have to have lots of money to dip your toes in the war. I'll put the link to Mozilla Hubs in the, uh, in the chat. Anyone here could go like this. I, I saw this morning a, a play. There was a theatre production inside this uh, world uh, um, yesterday. And cheap, very cheap and cheerful. Like, I mean, as you can see, the graphics are not particularly, oh, hang on, I'll just scroll back down. The graphics are not particularly uh, exciting. It's not a Disney production, but this is, this is a, a real theatre production taking place online for free for the public, with ha which have all they need is a decent internet connection. You don't even need all this stuff. VR is optional. If you don't have a VR headset, you just watch it on a 2D screen. The other thing, I mean, Kayla, this is so interesting. So I'm so glad that you came to talk to us and um, I find this really fascinating. But the other thing that comes to mind in terms of your question about civil society and how Peter responded is um, the other kind of institutional backing, I think, that could come from government but not government, you know, without putting their fingerprints on it, is something like the National Archives or, you know, making accessible um, libraries of information that in new and interesting ways that might not have, even been thought possible, but there's clearly a business case for spending public money on that, I would have thought. Do you know of um, libraries or information institutes that are doing that kind of work? Okay, that's a really good question. And the simple answer is, I don't think anyone is saying that all of these new um, experience methodologies are going to replace uh, there, there is no killer app in, say, library science for what we're describing. That said, that um, preview I showed you of our documentary, mm. within, it, is incredibly, it is increasingly feasible to provide a VR context for existing information. And that's, I'm really glad you mentioned that because when I showed you a little glimpse of my documentary, all of the data is being sucked from a, a, a completely separate database that journalists will be able to look at without having to go into VR. And that's very important to me, that it's not locked into a VR silo. It's not just a gimmick. Mm. So that, that um, metaverse tool that I just put in the chat, the two hubs, you can put any web content into a VR room right now in that space. So I was, I was the first webmaster of the National Library. 
Uh, so I know a little bit about that place, but you, you don't have to have worked at the National Library. You could just, within a couple of clicks, in fact, there's a create room button on hubs. You could say create room, National Library fan and make a room and then literally drag and drop links from your National Library web page and they would appear in virtual reality. So I, I think- we do a tech talk in here? <laughs> It's a really good question, Lizzie, because it's it's not about, I think it's the joining up of, of different data that is the most yeah. exciting metaverse concert. And it's the one right. area where Facebook is completely, it's the worst act, you know, in terms of bad actors in the system. They they There's no incentive for them to allow, in fact, there was a quote I saw from so the interview. So what's his plan? What's Zuckerberg's plan? So Well, he, the, he says it in a quote, actually. He says, in one sense, he says, quote, no company will run the metaverse, um, which is, he's, they're obviously trying. But then in the next <laughs> paragraph, he says, so other companies build out VR or AR platforms. Our software will be everywhere, uh, just like Facebook or Instagram is today. That is the vision well, of the Facebook. What could possibly go wrong? What could no, exactly. go wrong in that world? Yeah. It's um, a fascinating application of journalism too, isn't it, Dan? Yeah, we need to we need to talk, uh, Michaela. There's 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 lots here. It's, this is absolutely fascinating. I've um I've really uh, really enjoyed your insight as well. But um, looking forward to it. so when are you, when are you releasing the the documentary? When when I can't you can... wait to watch this doco. When <laughs> yeah. coming out? Look, it's a real challenge. Um, it's a good question too. So originally the plan was just like making the Mandalorian or something. The original plan for this project was that we were just going to make a video using virtual reality tools. So you see me, the host in VR, following my nose through all of these rabbit holes. Then because of COVID, and then, and then it would tour festivals as a physical, you could go to a festival and see it. Because of COVID, we've had to spin it on its head. And so the good news is that right now, if you have an expensive gamer VR setup, you can sign up for our beta testing right now and it'll be publicly available for anyone to use for free in August the 12th. The catch is you need to have desktop VR. So it's not gonna work on the fancy Oculus Facebook Quest device because as a business, we don't support Facebook uh, products, but it's a really bad decision. It's a really, it's a big challenge for us as a, mm -hmm. as a company because what is the most popular VR headset in the, mo in the world at the moment? the Oculus Quest. Mm -hmm. So you'll have, everyone will have to bear with us a bit while we, with very low funding, it's taken four years to get to this point. Um, and it is an activist project of sorts, but I thought I'd throw it in, not just about self-promotion, but it is possible to have indie voices in the metaverse. Um, I'm one of them. And there are lots of other people also doing this stuff. It's just a bit harder because we don't have easy access to the cash, but what we've done, we're going to put for this project, it's freely available for beta testing right now so the political response to zuckerberg's gambit is to build alternatives that are compelling i think so um and look i my career has been going between writing sci-fi about um, um you know cyberspace metaverse and then doing it for real um you know i've i've in the last couple of years i've done cyber security for transport systems and i've written hacks for transport into stories it's a really interesting terrifying space but at the same time i just think society wise we're not as empowered as we could be by a lot of this tech mm -hmm. there is an ethical tech movement and i think de developers are waking up to the fact that you can choose what projects you work on and i think they're also waking up to the fact that just because you need to pay your mortgage doesn't give you the right to say, oh, well, what my company does is none of my concern. I just work on level two, um, you know, writing this app. It's not, you know, so I think there's a, there's very interesting and sometimes delicate conversations with, you know, my peers who are computer scientists. I talk to my friends at Google, at Apple, at Amazon, and, you know, we ask each other the hard questions, but um, I, I'm, I'm glass half full. I'm very much glass half full. I, I keep I also thinking, oh, sorry. Sorry, Lizzie, you go, you go. Well, I just keep thinking about this from a legal perspective because I'm a lawyer. So, you know, I'm a hammer and everything's a nail. But one of the things I think about is I remember when Facebook acquired Oculus, um, 
and that it, you know, one of the developers is this guy called Palmer Lucky, who's a, an atrocious individual, individual um, big Trump supporter, among other things, you know, just awful guy. So aren't we thrilled that his company was acquired for $3 billion. But um, the point I was going to make is, I, I also don't want to reproduce the same mistakes we made in from an antitrust perspective um, in uh, the metaverse, I suppose, or in any kind of virtual reality setting, um, to perhaps use a less hyped term for the moment. Um, and you do sort of wonder at what point we're going to stop allowing Facebook to acquire companies, then sell hardware in a you know, loss-leading way, which is what they're doing. It's kind of like... Um, what Uber might have done, subsidising rides so that it could gain dominance in the market and then um, push out competitors. And this is seems like a classic example of that, where you're loss leading on this product so that other competing hardware products that might be more open or interoperable are not permitted to develop. And, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I, I I mostly like to think that that lawmakers actually know what they're doing and they're making decisions actively about tech, but in this space, I think they probably don't know what they're doing uh, and do need um, people to draw this to their attention rather than allow them to be taken in by the hype or to have these kinds of matters obscured so that then we have to fix it later, which is mm. proven to be much more damaging because it, it, it crushes the ecosystem for creativity. It, 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 it pushes, when it pushes out competitors, it's not just about market price. It's also about people developing different ideas of what might be possible being excluded and being purchased and acquired or, or bled dry. And, and those are both terrible problems. Even if you're a market capitalist, it's a terrible problem. It's not even a, just a problem for people who aren't that like me. I suppose. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, I mean, I think um, it's great that this article has has riled a few people up because like I said, this is a seven year, uh, Oculus was acquired seven years ago. Um, this isn't new stuff, but when, when antitrust discussions around Facebook appeared a few years ago, I can't remember the status now, I was really disappointed to see that Oculus was not mentioned once. The regulators weren't even looking at Oculus as part of Facebook to potentially break up. And then you know, you can extrapolate from what I was showing you that it's trivial to bring your Instagram photos into a virtual reality space. If, if Facebook is forced to lose WhatsApp or um, uh, Instagram, they can just roll out exactly the same things as part of what they are offering VR with, without a blink. This gets to the heart of the problem, picking up on what you've, you've just said then and, and you as well, Lizzie, is that the, 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 the problem with antitrust regulation, particularly in the US, is that it's so hard to predict where all this is going. And so when Facebook acquired Instagram, for example, yes, there were people that opposed it, but not many because Instagram was this tiny thing and people weren't really sure whether photo sharing was become a thing. And you look back on it and you go, well, that's just absolute madness and ridiculous. How could they not have seen it? But they're kind of making the same mistake with Oculus and VR here, right? Because it looks to be something completely separate um, albeit more separate to perhaps what Instagram was to Facebook, but I think you take my point. Mm. And you've got regulators that don't live in this space. Um, I mean, we all do, and I'm still struggling to keep up with this. Maybe I'm just the dumbest in the room. It wouldn't be the first time. But nonetheless, I think regulators would, would, would uh, how do you deal with, the, with this kind of thing? I think it's, um, it's a pretty wicked problem to solve. Yeah. yeah. Hey, we're coming up. Uh, we could go on for another hour, but I've got a hard two. Um, <laughs> that was fantastic, Michaela. Let's keep in touch. And I'd, you know, I feel like there has to be um, a paper on the metaverse that Jordan will pull together for Centre for Responsible <laughs> Technology before too long, because there are a whole bunch of policy discussions that pull off the end of this, but also opportunities if it's done well. And it's just been an absolute revelation to, to learn about some of your work. So thanks for being part of it today. And you too, Lizzie and Dan, and everyone that turned up. Um, we'll put a recording of this on... Um, our website as well, um, if anyone is motivated to, uh, particularly Michaela's contribution, share it around their network. Can I also well. put a pitch in, Pete, yeah. that um, oh, Jordan or someone also just um, pop some of the links that um, Michaela added there to the chat for people to poke around in on mod mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, yeah, and also to the extent anyone's interested, um, the project that Digital Rights Watch has talked about um, running town halls around what the internet could look like if it was built for people rather than big platforms. Um, we had our first event last night. We've got more coming up. If you want to know more about it, you can check them out on our website, sign up to our newsletter, and we'd love to see you at those town halls. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll also send through um, some links and put them up on our site too, Lizzie. Um, I've got to run though. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Taylor.
Bye. 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 Thanks for being part of it. Cheers. Okay. Bye. Hi, that was terrific. I'm I'm just staying in the. I'm just collecting everything in the chat that Michaela put in before I close down the whole thing. Um, Cause you know what, I'll close the thing then. If you're, so I reckon.